Welcome to the podcast today, where we celebrate innovation for a happy planet. I am your host, Abigail Carroll. Today, we're going to return to the subjects of seaweed and fashion. Fashion and smelly seaweed may seem like an odd pair, but one company in North Carolina is spinning them together, quite literally. Our guest is Laura Hayes, and she is the Senior Strategic Partnership Manager at Keel Labs. Keel Labs makes a natural silky yarn that is about 70% seaweed. Well, they're not the first to try to make fashion fibers out of seaweed. When it comes to seaweed usage and natural ingredients, I haven't heard of anybody coming close to this type of success. And the market seems pretty excited about the product as well. They are VC backed, having raised 13 million in a Series A, and their limited production is already overbooked. Trust that I've tried to get my hands on some. But enough from me, let's hear it from Laura. Welcome to the podcast, Laura. I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you so much for having me, Abigail. I'm really excited to be here too. You work for a company called Keel Labs and you all are innovating in the fashion industry. So tell me what you're doing. I work as Senior Strategic Partnerships Manager at Keel Labs. Keel Labs is the parent company. Our flagship product currently is something called Kelson, which is a seaweed-based yarn. And we see this as a truly viable alternative to a lot of the conventional materials that are being used in the market today, not only kind of your polyesters, but also your cottons and other natural materials. I want to put this in context because why is it so important now to be innovating in the fashion segment? First and foremost, 70% of the greenhouse gas emissions that are coming from the fashion and textile industry today are directly related to materials. So the main materials being used in the fashion industry and textile industry, unfortunately, are fossil fuel reliant. So they're your petrochemical based materials such as polyester. And if you look even at the fast fashion industry today, they're churning out whatever, 10,000 items a day on some of their apps. And the majority of those are heavily polyester based. There's truly a need to find better materials. I just want the listeners to understand that 10% of global carbon emissions are actually coming from the fashion industry. That is the equivalent of all the carbon emitted by international flights and the whole shipping industry combined. So finding alternatives to polyester and plastic-based fabrics are really important. So why are we using so much polyester? We've had cotton for a long time. We've had linen for a long time. Why did we become so reliant on polyester? Unfortunately, it's just, it's quite cheap to make actually. And if you look at fast fashion industry today, they're churning out so many clothes that they need a material that is very cheap. So tell me more about the seaweed fabric. Like, what does it feel like? I mean, the idea of wearing seaweed is so interesting. Are we going to smell like seaweed? (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely not. (laughs) So Kelson is our first product, certainly not our last. I guess what's really unique about it is the fact that, to your point, it's created with over 75% kelp with the remaining solution being the salt and water additives to help the fiber to actually perform and extrude. It feels quite like a Pima cotton in terms of its hand feel. It's got the kind of hand feel of the materials that consumers are used to today. It's naturally an off-white in color as well, but it also performs behind the scenes quite like a viscose in terms of things like its sustainability properties, elongation, abrasion, and other performance criteria. What we really kind of pride ourselves on is being a solution that we see manufacturers being able to easily plug and play our fiber into what they're using today. So we really built this company with the view to its scaling. We don't basically harvest or grow kelp ourselves. I get this question a lot. So (laughs) we don't have a seaweed farm. Not yet. Not yet, exactly. (laughs) Maybe in the future. (laughs) You'll be harvesting seaweed before you know it, Laura. (laughs) (laughs) So we work with production companies based in both Europe and Asia who source a component of this kelp that we use and they extract that from the kelp. It's actually currently being wildly harvested, the harvest that our production companies are using. We purchase that in powder form, basically. And then we add various 
non-toxic additives to that formulation. That's where our IP comes into play in order to create a fiber, essentially. And that's the amazing thing about seaweed, right? So we see it in so many other industries, namely beauty and food, for example. But it's also incredible in terms of clothes. It's got natural antibacterial properties which open us up to working with activewear industry and sportswear industry as well. It has some incredible natural properties. Kelp is regenerative. It improves generally the acidification of the oceans where it's grown and harvested. It doesn't require any additional pesticides or any additional chemicals, any additional water usage. Exactly. And it absorbs actually the CO2 from the air as well. It's a wonder crop. You mentioned you're creating a yarn. Are you actually weaving it into fabric or are you giving it to other people to make fabric? We mix that solution that I was talking about. So the powder and the salt and water solution on site. So either at our HQ, which is in North Carolina, or with one of our partners based in Europe. And we actually then, out of that comes yarns, which we sell to our partners who then go away and make various types of prototypes. So the people, your partners, are these the design houses or are these fabric houses that are your client today? It's mainly the brands themselves. We're working with the innovation teams, the supply chain teams within the brands. But conversely, we are also in direct contact with their suppliers as well, which is super important for us because we obviously want to share a lot of our key learnings and our know-how. We've built a product over a number of years at this point that has been perfected and we definitely are open and want to share our key learnings. It's kind of on both sides. It's definitely a development partnership. We're working to perfect and ping pong together and kind of exchange ideas and innovate and bump up the thickness of the material and do dye tests and everything else. That's great. So the company was started a couple years ago in the States. Is that right? It was in 2017. It was co-founded by Tassie Callahan and Alex Gishofsky. So we were originally based out of Brooklyn and the company was called AlgaeNet. And we actually underwent a rebrand last year to become Kiel Labs. You know, I think AlgaeNet functioned beautifully in terms of a literal translation of what we were doing. But we recognize as well that it kind of pigeonholed some applications, hence why we we underwent this beautiful transformation into Kiel Labs. Interesting. So you, you're not the only people in the seaweed space, but to my knowledge, the highest percentage of macroalgae in other people's fabrics is like 30%. So you've managed to really, really create a much more sustainable fabric. You know what? We know of a certain indirect competitor of ours as well, who's actually playing with less than 5%. Oh. So if you look at that jump, yeah, it's incredible, right? It's what makes us so special. There is sadly a lot of uh, you know companies out there who are claiming to be something that maybe they're not Exactly. Right. A lot of greenwashing out there. So when other people are greenwashing and making claims with something like a yarn or a fabric, that's pretty hard for the consumer to be able to dig in and see the sort of fraud. (laughs) So how do you protect your brand against that? You know, I read recently that there is over, I think it's 450 different sustainability labeling conventions. Wow. So like the onus is totally put on the consumer to figure out what's going on. And I think ultimately you'd probably want a PhD to figure out what is the best. Luckily, you know, there is regulation, hopefully that will be coming into place that will make that as clearer. But to your point, in terms of how we communicate what we do, so it's actually a complete new type of material that we're making. So we're not a natural cellulosic material or a man-made cellulosic material. And this is something that we're working actually with our pilot program partners on. We don't yet have all the answers, but you know, for that labeling, that's something that we seriously have to consider and something that we'll be kind of digging into in the coming months. And hopefully around that as well, there'll be some sort of educational component just to try and really communicate the message of what makes material different. And also when it comes to end of life, what makes us different? Because that is such an important component today of next gen materials, but also conventional materials. Right. Could a kelp shirt be composted potentially? Yeah, it's interesting you bring up composting because we've actually just, we've got the initial results of our latest composting tests. And we've previously done a lot of marine and landfill environment testing, but we've just basically received an update that within 60 days, calcium composts 
and it's wow. 100% bio-based. So we're not even talking years here, which is incredible. When we got this, I was like, wow, okay, I have to tell everyone straight away. But of course, we also do rely on our partners and the brands that we have started to work with for further testing of garments. So, you know, there's also elements like the buttons, the zips, etc. Right. We really need to work closely with the people that we're starting to onboard, those teams, to make sure that we're correctly looking after the end of life of the material. So on the other side, how about the longevity of the garment? If I think of something as compostable, I might worry that, oh, if I wash it too many times, it's going to compost in my washing machine. Also a good point. And you know what? I came from a very different world before joining Kiel Labs. And that was definitely something that I was thinking about when we were doing all these tests. Like it's all well and good that it composts, but does that right. mean it when I wear it, it disintegrates? <laughs> you spill some but... wine on it and it starts composting on you immediately. <laughs> But the answer is that calcium performs very like a visco. So in yeah. terms of a lot of different properties, it's certainly not going to disintegrate as you wear it. It's more so when it's in a specific environment where that can be enabled, that it really breaks down. Yeah, with certain bacteria that or something you exactly. might find. Exactly, exactly. I'll continue our conversation with Laura after a short break. A big thanks to the Maine Technology Institute, MTI, investing in innovation for a prosperous Maine. MTI is Maine's unique public-private partnership whose core mission is to diversify and grow Maine's economy by accelerating innovation in the state's targeted technology sectors. MTI offers grants, loans, equity investments, and services to support Maine entrepreneurs and organizations as they transform their innovative ideas into new products, services, and companies leading to the creation of quality jobs for Maine people. For more information about MTI and its programs, please visit mainetechnology.org. For a blue economy to thrive, people need to use more sustainable products. But which products? And will consumers actually adopt them? Innovators like you are hustling to figure this out. Spark number nine can tell you if there's demand for your product. Spark markets your product before it's built using online advertising so you launch smarter. Have a big idea? Vet it with Spark before you build. Visit Spark online at www.sparkno9.com or find them on LinkedIn. Welcome back to Happy Planet. So when are we going to start seeing, you know, Kiel Labs-based clothing in the stores when are we gonna be able to wear this trust me the minute that i see it you'll be the first to know basically well, i'll be the first but... to wear of your guinea pig <laughs> absolutely so we started working with our first pilot program partners as of last year so around the september time and what we've done since then with them is to test and evaluate the material make sure it works for those brands and now they're also ranging from mass market brands all the way to like highly craftsmanship orientated brands so we've really picked this beautiful kind of group of unique partners and now we're kind of moving on to the prototyping side of things that's the next step here so we've kind of said to ourselves you know everything looks good the test check out this is great Let's move on to kind of target products here. Like, what do you want to see? What do you really want Kelson to be in? Is it a t-shirt? Is it a dress? Is it, you know, a knit garment, for example? Right, or a leisure wear. Kind of more cotton-based right. leisure wear, exactly. All I can say is stay tuned. Towards the end of this year, we'll have a lot of exciting news. And we're starting to onboard our next group of partners as well. So the next 12 months for us is going to be really exciting when it comes to releasing prototypes, but also hopefully being in collections in stores. So it's imminent. That's what I can say right now. That's amazing. I'd like to know when you approach these big French names or big European names or big American names, and you say we have seaweed fabric, I want to know what the reactions are. We've been so lucky that there's been so much outreach to Kiel Labs in terms of what we do. I joined the company thinking I would have to be on Salesforce every day, but the amount of inbound demand we've had is incredible. So a lot of these companies, and I count for sure in their, the luxury brands as well as the, the mass market brands, 
they already know what we're doing. And they reach out because they're just like, when can we get our hands on this? Like, when can we start getting one or two samples? Like, we'll work with anything. Give us two kilos, give us whatever you can. So for the most part, we've had super engaged customers, potential clients, inbound leads who know what we do, but five minutes into the conversation, if they don't, they're kind of like, okay, I'm here for this. This is cool. Like, this is definitely something, once you kind of address the question of how does this look, how does it perform? They're like, what? You know, it looks like a cotton. So we don't even have to kind of do massive amounts of education for our consumers. The hand feel is there, right? So it feels exactly like what they're used to today. And it also has properties that are also familiar to brands. So like sustainable qualities, abrasion and all the rest. Well, you also get to ride the seaweed wave because everybody's <laughs> yeah. talking about seaweed right now. So you're getting a lot of lift probably from the, just the general seaweed talk and you're not trying to get people to eat it. <laughs> it's yeah. easier to get people to wear it probably. <laughs> Absolutely. So in terms of the business, you started in 2017. It sounds like we're going to be hearing about some products maybe hitting the market sometime later this year, early next year. Financially, are you guys fundraising? What does that look like? So we're venture capital backed. We raised our Series A last year. I think it was around the June time. So 13 million. Wow. We're super, super proud. Yeah. And that basically enabled us to scale up production, build out production lines, and also to establish customer relationships and start working with the brands that we need to, to perfect calcium yeah. and to bring it to market as soon as possible. So we've been very fortunate in that respect. Obviously, the market is a bit tricky right now, but we're super confident. If you look kind of at some of our competitors, there's Bolt Threads, which was recent news. They've paused production on Milo, which was their mycelium leather. But we're confident. We have a team of 27 who are growing. We have a product that really hits kind of the core three points that a next gen material has to in order to kind of succeed. So we've really built this with a view to scaling it to being at price parity with materials that our customers purchase today, because it's all well and good being sustainable. But if you can't match materials that your customers are using today, even if they have incredible sustainability properties, you can only do so much. Right. With it's got to so work. 100%. And we also have the performance. We've done tests. We're doing ongoing tests. We're working with our customers to constantly perform tests. So we have a product that is built to last for sure and scale as well, which is super, super important. You mentioned a change in the market. And what is that change? What is going on in the fashion market right now? There's quite a few different things going on, mainly around upcoming legislation and regulations that will be coming in. Regulations around sustainable labeling, rules on circular production as well. A lot more responsibility on the manufacturers. And I want to say this is especially in the EU, eventually also, of course, in the US and, and other areas. These kind of incumbents aren't going to change unless they're forced to change. So I think this is certainly a really good thing. Being on the partner side of things and speaking to a lot of the European brands, they know it's going to be soon required. They know it's coming. And that's why they're starting to kind of adjust their business models. What I will say is that it seems like a lot of it isn't going to come into place until 2025, even 2026. So it's kind of moving slowly, but surely. But that paired with customer appetite for better materials is really what is driving the next gen material industry at the moment. That's great. So what can people do? I mean, there are going to be listeners and they're all going to be depressed. <laughs> like, what can we do? <laughs> what can listeners do? What can I do? How can we have fun with clothing, enjoy the aesthetics of it without destroying the planet? The most sustainable choice you can make is keeping what you have already in circulation. Try and at least get 30 wares from what you're purchasing, whatever that is, whatever price point that is. And afterwards, look to resell by second hand. I think there's kind of two things that I would certainly focus in on. Let's say you're in, you're in a boutique. Start with the end in mind, basically. Like what happens to this item when I'm done with it? And Unfortunately, right now, that does require the consumer to do the heavy lifting. So it means checking the labels and trying to understand what the makeup of, of the article is. But that is super key. Polyester, for example, avoid plastic. So yeah. 
if you make a product from something good, it goes back to being something good. Unfortunately, the fossil fuel industry and petrochemical industry have a lot to answer for. Yeah. So you're in Europe. So that's an interesting thing to me too, because, you know, this is a US based company and they are pre revenue. They've got an office in Paris. And lucky you, you get to be <laughs> the queen of Paris right now. So that's an interesting choice. I'd like to know more about that choice. I actually haven't come from kind of next-gen material background at all. Kiel Labs was my first kind of career venture into this world. And so it was about a year and a half ago that I joined Kiel. And I reached out just because I had been doing a bit of consulting in the kind of sustainability communication field. I was working with a lot of small startups and I loved doing that. So helping them to communicate about what they were doing. Truly, truly sustainable companies who were doing amazing things in their field, mainly based in Europe. And I was pairing one up with H&M at the time. And so we were kind of starting to form this partnership. And I got, started to get to know the team at H&M pretty well, one particular team. And I started to learn more about their plans and what their kind of roadmap over the next couple of years looked like. And they were telling me basically that they were looking at basically better materials, so nice to hear. X exactly. X percentage of their collections being next gen or better materials than what they currently use today. And conversely, because they are a mass market brand and they have a certain image, they wanted to talk about what they were doing. And so in my head, I was like, okay, I've kind of ticked the box about around sustainability communications. And if I really want to kind of help move the needle here, next gen material companies, I'm going to start looking for who's out there, what they're doing. And it took a while because a lot of these companies are early stage. There's really not a lot of jobs in this field at all. Well, there wasn't at the time. There's more and more now. But I reached out to Kiel Labs. There was one position going. And I kind of said, hey, like, I love what you're doing. Can we talk? Obviously, at the time, they were based in Brooklyn. And I was actually based in Paris then. And I think luckily they allowed me to, once having accepted the job offer, to stay in Paris because Tessa Callan, our CEO, she kind of said, right, well, that's where a lot of the you know brands that are really focused on sustainability are coming from here. They understand that regulations are coming in, that there's going to be more of an onus on them to find better materials. A lot of them were in Europe. So in France, they were in the UK, they were in Scandinavia, and they were super forward thinking companies. And it kind of made sense. I was a Eurostar away from London. I was based in Paris, where a lot of the big luxury brands are. I see it as the main capital of fashion. Yeah, amazing. You have a fashion background. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about you and what it was like to sort of move towards the sustainable fashion industry. I started my career in a company called Richemont, which is the parent company for a lot of amazing craftsmanship oriented brands. So we're talking kind of high jewelry and luxury fashion. So Mont Blanc, Van Clef and Arpels, all the way to your Chloe's and your Elias. So that's kind of where I started. I built out the first CSR strategy there at group level. And obviously then just got a taste for sustainability and if you start, I was so fortunate to start with building out strategies because you really get this bird's eye view in terms of what needs to be done. And we focused on every single brand in that strategy within the group. And they were so diverse and so different. But what I really loved is that all of these brands within this company, for the most part, are building products that are made to last. That's very much in the French DNA in terms of luxury. So in a way, it's sustainable in its own way, right? So starting there was great. And then I moved to Stella McCartney in the UK. And what was really great about that is that, you know, you were then focusing on one brand specifically and really kind of rolling up your sleeves and digging in. It was a small team at the time. I eventually started the brand partnerships team there. I was one of the founding members of that. And yeah, stayed there for a couple of years. Obviously, Stella McCartney goes without saying is like the reference when it comes to luxury and sustainability and God, I learned so much there. And then I moved to kind of resales, which was fashion, but you were talking kind of the end of the chain, right? So keeping the products in circulation, circular economy. So making sure that everything that we purchase today doesn't go to somewhere, let's take- Landfills. Exactly. A landfill, like we've all seen those 
photos of sub-Saharan Africa and the Chilean desert. No one wants that. And so that, of course, is definitely addressing a different part of the problem when it comes to sustainability. Conversely, there as well, was working on the brand partnership side of things and got my first taste for startup life from Vestiaire Collective. Um, <laughs> oh, it's addictive. <laughs> yeah. It's a mature startup. So it was 10 years old at that time. But I realized I loved it. It was super exciting. And I thought fashion and startups, like what a brilliant combination if you can put in sustainability into that as well. Like to me, that's just a recipe for success. I started working with small startup fashion brands and connecting them with bigger partners and then moved into the fashion materials world. So you've been on the sort of product side, but also now you're on sort of more the supply chain side. And that's really interesting. For sure. It's where you can really move the needle as well, right? Where the real kind of change is made. So what is it going to take to make a seismic shift in this fashion industry? Like 85% of clothes are winding up in these trash heaps in these developing countries. It's a disaster. How are we going to make this right again? God, that is a big question. And honestly, it takes a village, right? There's not one company, there's not one brand who can create the seismic shift on their own. So as much as it sounds a bit cliche at this point, I think next gen material companies collaborating together and also brands collaborating together to actually create change and move the needle is really what's needed. Something that our co-founders really pride themselves on and really encourage us to do is to kind of speak to adjacent companies in the market and kind of start to share a little bit more about what the challenges we're facing are how we can kind of work together to kind of shift. And if we need certain data, for example, let's try and get that together. Let's encourage the companies to provide us with this data. That definitely is going to help, like close collaboration. And I think also we often quite villainize mass market brands, right? So I'm talking fast fashion here, your H&M's, your Zara's, et cetera. And, you know, there is an element of, yes, correct. But also the simple truth is, is that, We need those brands to create change. Right, they have the power. 100%. I look at my cousin, she's a teenager, so she can't afford to buy, you know, a hundred euro sustainable made t-shirt as much as she would like to. And, you know, right now, if you want to purchase sustainably, you kind of have to be able to kind of loosen the purse strings. Like you need to be able to afford it. And so working with fast fashion brands and working with mass market brands you're able to truly create change there. Consumers are looking for better materials and it's now up to the brands to work with next-gen material companies, work with better material companies in order to provide better solutions. The thing is, like, we're just, as humans, we consume. So we can kind of educate people to consume less. But, you know, at the end of the day, people are still going to want to buy that new dress, that new t-shirt, well, it brings whatever it joy. Is. I mean, that's, I think that's one of the fundamental things. I mean, I love clothes. I love textiles. I would hate to live in a world where every time I bought something, I had to feel like I was a villain. Absolutely. But I also want to do, do good. And so if you can merge those, that seems to be a happy place. I read something interesting recently and someone was saying, look, we didn't tell people to stop buying cars. We just started providing better solutions. And I mean, the same, I think, for food too, right? Exactly. We're trying to just erase some of the bad trends that got, that took hold. I think when we tried to make everything efficient and fast, we lost some of the good things. For sure, for sure. I can't thank you enough for coming on and sharing the story. This has been really, really interesting. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's estimated that 35% of ocean microplastics can be traced to textiles, making them the largest source of microplastic pollution in the world's oceans. That bodes well for the future of Kiel Labs. We're taking a break at Happy Planet and will return in September. Our lineup for the fall is looking fantastic. In the meantime, please feel free to catch up on past podcasts and share your favorites with a friend. As always, thank you for listening. Please follow Happy Planet wherever you listen to podcasts and leave us a rating and review. It actually does help new listeners discover the show. 
Happy Planet was reported and hosted by me. I am also the executive producer. The talented Dylan Hoyer is our producer and editor. Composer George Brandel Egloff created our theme music. Learn more about my work and get in touch by visiting happyplanetpodcast.com.